Welcome back to Solving Basketball. I am Jordan Sperber, and today I'm talking about the NCAA selection process and the net with ESPNer John Gassaway. We'll get that conversation going quickly, but I did tell John I was going to do a brief introduction on the difference between resume and predictive rankings, which are both talked about at length during this episode. You can't evaluate a ranking system without its goal in mind. So the goal of a resume ranking is obviously to determine who has the best resume. The two best resume ratings we have publicly available are called wins above bubble and strength of record. They're actually really simple. They look at the schedule that any given team plays and then try to determine how an average or a bubble team would play if they had that schedule. Then you compare that average performance that would be expected to the team's actual performance against the schedule. So, for example, a team that went 20 and 10 against a schedule that a bubble team should go 18 and 12 against would be plus two wins above bubble. On the other hand, a predictive ranking is actually the foundation of any good resume ranking. Predictive rankings determine how good teams or schedules are. The goal of a predictive ranking is very simple. Who would win the next time between Team A and Team B? Not who won last time, but given a variety of factors, everything that we know about these teams, who would win the next time? That's the goal of a predictive ranking. And that's why predictive rankings will use preseason priors and other non-resume information because it improves the predictive power. Kempom is the most used predictive ranking, but there are plenty of others out there. John will provide plenty of context on all of this during the pod, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. But for more information specifically on wins above bubble versus the quadrant system, I do have a video from October that's basically a primer on all this at youtube.com slash hoopvision68. What is basketball? What is it? Is this basketball? Is that basketball? What is What is basketball? Today's guest is not only a college basketball writer for ESPN, but I think he might be the most referenced person in this podcast history. I feel like his name comes up almost every episode, John Gassaway. Thank you for coming on today, John. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor as well. It's good to be here. I've been deviating a little bit on the podcast recently. So I want to be consistent here. Our first question for every guest is supposed to be, if we went to a gym right now and I went under the hoop to rebound for you and you shot 100 free throws in a row, how many would you make? Well, I want that to be my first question, too. That's that's a good question. You're not just dangling it out there. I can ask. I can answer it. Right. Yes. Um, This uh, this is uh, I I can answer this from. from an empirical base, because that's what I do <laughs> more than uh, more than live full court as I shoot free throws. And uh, sad to say, I would be down to about uh, 72 at this point. OK, so you say down. Does that mean what about prime oh, John Gasaway? Uh, prime back in the day that <laughs> I was uh, I was scratching a, a number that started with an eight. But uh, no, that's uh, that's a distant memory. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. So you do have, have Ken Pomeroy edged. He, he was the first guest and, and you, you have him beat. Yeah. Um, I think back in the day, uh, if, if any podcast listeners have visited the, uh, NCAA offices in, uh, Indianapolis and, and not the actual offices, of course, but they're, I think it's called the hall of champions, but anyway, they've got a faux, uh, old school Indiana high school gym, a la Hoosiers, and uh, actual basketballs, and you can just sit there uh, shooting free throws. And I think uh, once upon a time, I took on uh, Kyle Welliston, and uh, the 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 gods were with me that day. I made a, a striking nine out of ten. So uh, that, that it can uh, it can wax and wane, but I, I think seventy two is about right. 
So for this podcast, I think that people would probably guess just based off of the guests that I pick, we're going to go into the selection process and net. Obviously, by the time this podcast airs, it will have been a week since the first net uh, rankings were released. And one of the things that has frustrated me is how all over the place the debate has been. And I guess that's mostly just a function of Twitter but not a lot of structure. So I tried to come up with the best way to discuss not just net, but the selection process in general. And one thing that doesn't get talked about enough, I think, is any ranking system is only as good as the purpose of that system. And I'm not sure that we really even know what the purpose of net is. But since you are a bit of a selection process, an RPI historian, you've written some articles on the history of RPI. To your knowledge, what was the purpose behind RPI and and the purpose behind the selection process from, or maybe back in the day? Yeah, you raise an excellent point because the RPI was very much a tool for a specific purpose. And it's ironic that uh, decades later, it came to be defended um, and indeed diminished <laughs> by saying it's just one tool. The subtext of the statement being we know it's not that good and, and people can are free to use other things. But in the beginning, it, it w- had a very specific uh, purpose. And that was at the time that it came into being, which was uh, it was actually developed uh, by a guy named Jim Van Valkenburg in the, in the fall of 1980. Uh, the tournament was still the tournament field was still 48 teams. It would uh, shortly move up to 52 teams. But where I'm going with this uh, piece of trivia is simply that the NCA was envisioning a, a time in the not too distant future when they would have to start telling certain Division One conferences, "No, you no longer." get an auto bid because we've only got 48 or 52 slots and we want to get, you know, as many of the best teams in the country uh, read as major conference teams primarily, although not exclusively. And so they were trying to find a way to measure which conferences were the very worst and the RPI was going to help them do that. And that's not the only reason they use the RPI, of course, and they did use it to look at individual teams. And in the early years, there were some daring at large uh, selection choices made. And you can tell that they uh, thought that they had the wherewithal to do that because they had this fancy new metric with uh, with printouts behind them. But uh, it it your your point is is very good. And it reminds me that. That's where it was coming from originally. It turned out, of course, to be a moot point. They expanded the field to 64 teams. And uh, to this day, every Division One conference gets an auto bid. And uh, personally, I, I kind of like that, uh, speaking subjectively. But that is where the RPI was coming from originally uh, 38 years ago now. Wow. And it, it's, I think, you, correct me if I'm wrong, fair to say that the RPI, when it came out, was a reasonably cutting edge metric, right? Uh, it was a metric period. And it's uh, one of the paradoxes of the RPI. And what, what made it such an interesting story to me, at least to look into, is that uh, administratively, the the initiative to create the RPI, I would argue, is entirely uh, praiseworthy and laudable. And it was a forward thinking NCAA that, you know, for anybody who doesn't know their ancient tournament history, uh, when the RPI was created, the tournament had only recently made the switch to being something that had at-large teams at all. Previously, of course, it was just a a tournament of champions. You had to win your league to get into the NCAA tournament. And it had only been about five years since they'd made the switch. And correctly, the NCAA said, well, we need a a metric with which to judge these teams. And the the, uh, statistical environment in 1979, 1980 was not great. There was not... Uh, Ken Palm or any of these uh, fancy things that we take for granted nowadays. And they 
they spent months uh, developing something from the ground up and they looked at a lot of different options and that is what they came up with. So uh, cutting edge, you know, that's in the eye of the beholder, but it had to have been, it had to feel like a big advance because where previously all they had to go by was final scores and winning percentages. Now they had a printout in the room, you know, that listed teams in an order that uh, seemed to have some method behind it. So it was uh, definitely something new. So at that time, it sounds like RPI was being used. The ranking ex- itself for an individual team was still highly relevant towards the later end of its career, if you will, for, for RPI, it became this sorting tool, uh, organizational tool for the quadrant system. When did that shift? Um, that shifted, I would s- characterize it as surprisingly late. I mean, it was just uh, the discussion behind the selection and seeding was what it was for a solid three decades or so. And then uh, we started, I would suggest, getting a little more savvy and a little more wise about the way that we were evaluating teams. And it did become this sorting mechanism. Uh, I think an often overlooked uh, point in the history, however, is that it was uh, one time Duke head coach Vic Bubis who originally came up with the idea of looking at a team's record versus the top 50 or top whatever RPI opponents. And that is completely independent of the RPI itself. You can do that with any metric. You can look at record versus top 50, whatever, net or anything. But he was the guy that did that. And he actually had uh, interns that worked for him. (laughs) He was a member of the NCAA Men's Basketball Committee by this point. And they compiled that data and it created something of a trend in the in the room. And I think we're still there. I think that's been every bit as influential as the RPI itself. And when you talk about a sorting mechanism, record versus top 50 blank, uh, that's where we're at. And I think that's what we see today with the quadrant system. So uh, we can get into the nuts and bolts of of the net. But I mean, this is the uh, this is the basic scaffolding within within which the the net or any uh, ranking system is is working when it's uh, used by the NCAA in 2019. I read that fact about the Duke coach that came up with the record versus top 50. He made people Uh, he made his staff calculate that for every team. And I think that's pretty funny and it aligns perfectly with some of my experiences with coaches because a lot of times I feel like the pushback to all this talk about net and the selection process is like, who cares? Who who cares if if a team's a four seed versus a five seed or, or, or whatever. But I can say from firsthand experience that coaches definitely care. So One of the staffs I worked on, I think almost every pregame meal, which is about four or five hours before a game on game day, usually the staff sits together at a table. And every pregame meal, we had our phones out on the ESPN app looking at how our non-conference opponents were doing that day because we knew that in RPI, the record of your opponents was huge. Uh, The other example I have of metrics... Um, determining coaching behavior is at the end of games in blowouts I had assistant coaches and head coaches look at me and ask me about the implications of the next two minutes of a blowout game based on Kempom or based on whatever the metric is and so I do think that it's pretty funny that a Duke coach almost inadvertently invented the quadrant system and it's been incredibly powerful. Coaches are right to care. And when I was researching the history of the RPI, one great story that I, did, I didn't have room for, I mean, the first thing I wrote about the RPI was like 5,000 words long. As I, well, it was too long anyway. So it's, it's, it's amazing that you know things didn't get in there because it seemed like everything did. But there was a great story about... Uh, you know, John Calipari, Memphis era, John Calipari, uh, 
talking on the phone for hours to the NCAA <laughs> trying to understand this newfangled uh, RPI metric and, and how to please it. Uh, that's a coach's job to care. Now, we can, you know, this is not meant to segue to a subsequent discussion, but I would like to see coaches not have to be on the phone, you know, trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of a metric. I would like to see them concentrating on on being the, you know, having the, the best team they can have. And for that matter, not worrying too much about, you know, how their schedule will be perceived either, but rather how they want their schedule to develop their team. And that's a concern I have with, with in a test that I want any rating system to satisfy is that it, it frees up coaches to do that. But uh, to your point, absolutely coaches care. And I would add to, to bring this full circle, uh, coaches care about the net. And I, I don't know what, what your experience is, Jordan, just since uh, the net was rolled out, meaning the rankings were indeed since it was announced a few months ago. But I mean, coaches absolute uh, angst would be one word I would use. <laughs> coaches absolutely want to know how this how this thing is going to work, and how, you know how how their team will will look, and and how their schedule will perform in terms of net. Uh, coaches very much do care. Absolutely, yeah. And I have had a couple reach out to me about the whole margin of victory thing, which we're going to get into a little bit later. And then also when when putting together twenty. 20 2021 schedules like you said but to keep going with this a little bit in your estimation what does the ncaa selection committee say to the best team versus most deserving team currently yeah i've uh i've long been of the uh of the mind that they need to uh, reconcile their language with their practices. And that's not to say that they have to change their practices. You can bring uh, language in line with practices and, and their, their guidelines say they want the, the best teams. And I think we can all agree that's a, that's a pretty non-controversial statement, but you know, obviously there's, uh, cases where the best teams uh, don't play anywhere close to their potential, and that's that's where things start to get interesting. So it's not really as simple as just taking the best teams, and that is why we have these discussions of uh, predictive versus resume kind of metrics, and we can talk about the, the best way to bring those two together. Uh, I absolutely welcome the uh, passing of the RPI. And I think that it is a uh, long overdue, but nevertheless welcome uh, sign of remarkable progress toward uh, bringing uh, best and most deserving teams together in a transparent and harmonious uh, decision-making process. So I, I don't want to bury the lead here. Uh, the RPI is dead. And, uh, you know, if you'd told me that a year ago, I mean, I'd, I would be dedicating this entire discussion just to that fact. And when we talk about, well, the net does this or doesn't do that, this is the subtext is that, you know, we waited literally 38 years to be able to get to something besides the RPI. So this is something of a precious opportunity. Uh, we don't know if the net will be here for 38 more years. So we need to, we need to grasp this moment and get it right and uh, be wise and transparent about how we do finesse uh, best and most deserving. And uh, that's that's the task that the NCA has before it. So before we do get into the net, let's go to the time period where the RPI is dead and now we need to replace it with something. If John Gassaway was commissioner of the NCAA, what system are you replacing the RPI with before net has been introduced into the conversation? Uh, I guess my first and most important uh, um, command edict uh, <laughs> law from on high 
would be that whatever I do, it, it's going to be experimental, and we're going to revisit this. Um, we're we're, we're going to we're going to run it as a mock uh, for the first season, and then we'll do it for real the second season and revisit it uh, with a blank slate the third. So nothing is is locked in. Uh, but I would uh, I would. Having said that, I would uh, adopt Wins Above Bubble. I think it brings together resume and predictive uh, elegantly. It looks at all games, not just your uh, five best wins or your five best losses, <laughs> worst losses. Uh, you're, you're building, it's a metric where you're, you're building it or it's being deducted from your record on every game, even the ones that nobody watches or thinks are particularly important. And uh, most obviously, it gives no uh, incentive for running up the score, but it does uh, harness the, in my experience, uh, very insightful uh, information to be gleaned from taking an entire season and treating it as a body of thousands of possessions where you can score zero, one, two, three, or even on occasion four points. And so you're so can your opponent. That's just a, a much more detailed picture yielded there than by the uh, up, down, win, loss, um, 30 or 40 uh, decisions you get there. So I would uh, take a long, long look at wins above bubble. And so this is a little bit of a technical question, but wins above bubble needs to be built on something to evaluate how good that schedule was a predictive rating usually. So that would be like the one thing I could see the NCAA not loving the fact that they have to use some metric to decide how good that schedule was. Do you see that as an issue? Um, I would treat that issue with total transparency and with, uh, with small C Catholic approach to multiple metrics, you know, I wouldn't say we're going to go only with, you know, ACME metric and at the expense of Ajax. I mean, that we're, we're at a time of unprecedented uh, bounty in terms of great uh, team rating systems. And they've got long track records. We can take the ones that have proven themselves and, to uh, make a small but crucial, uh, getting back to coaches' care, uh, a small but crucial point, you, I would want you to be really transparent about, well, what are you going to do when the best player is injured? You know, and I would want steps for that. And here, here's what's going to happen when that's the case. Uh, those kinds of things. Here's how we treat uh, Rome, road, home, and neutral. And here's how we treat uh, the Sprint Center for Kansas. You know, all, all those, all those things. Uh, as long as we approach those with transparency and with an openness to multiple sources of information and with an agreement beforehand, let's come back and uh, what does the military call it, an after action review or something. As long as we uh, have those three methodological uh, principles, uh, I think that we'll get incre incrementally better every time we do it. In your alternate universe here where we're using winds above bubble, what is the role or is there a selection committee? Yeah, in my, uh, in John Gasway's uh, utopia, would it be, or, or am I just named the czar? Uh, either way, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think there is a need for a selection committee because once we've got uh, winds above bubble, that and our auto bids, of course, can uh, seed our field for us 1 to 68. And then this has nothing to do with rating systems, but I just think it would be a much more uh, entertaining and a much more 2019 method appropriate means of bracketing the field if we simply had a bracket draft uh, once we had the field seated 1 to 68. And I've been talking to uh, coaches about this, and some of them think it's crazy, and some of them think it's great, and but all of them uh, ponder the possibilities of, you know, being on national TV, uh, NBA draft style and being on the clock and, you know, okay, uh, university of Michigan, you know, where, where do you choose to play? And, uh, I just, I, I think 
it would elegantly solve the problem that the current rights holder, uh, CBS slash Turner, has where, you know, they want to sell ads. And I understand that they, they want good TV. And I understand that. But it's hard to do that when you're just saying these are the these are the teams and you're trying to draw that out as long as possible. And everybody's watching and saying, we just want to know the teams. It would be way cooler. Uh, we already know who the teams are. It would be way cooler. OK, you know, where's uh, where's Tom Izzo going to choose to play? Uh, I think it would be good TV and it would free up the hardworking uh, men and women on the committee to just watch and enjoy along with the rest of us. So that's uh, that's my proposal. Yeah, that's pretty compelling. So to recap it, it's wins above bubble. A resume rating is deciding who's in the field. And then not even a predictive rating is deciding seating, but coaches themselves. Who, who It's natural selection, basically. So it's good for TV ratings for that. It's pretty good analytically, I, w- I would say. It, it's an interesting solution for sure. Yeah, I think, and you know, as part and parcel of a true bracket draft, you'd have to get rid of the uh, limits on you know teams from the same conference can't play each other until such and such a time. I mean, you know, how cool would it be, you know, if uh, and, and of course they would be working within their seed line. Don't get me wrong, but still, how cool would it be if, for instance, you know, uh, a team from the ACC. Uh, they, they've got uh, four slots to choose from on the board and they go ahead and choose to play a fellow ACC team in the round of 64. You know, this is uh, this is going to happen in front of a live crowd, again, NBA draft style, and the crowd goes, ooh, you know. I mean, just uh, just 10, 100 times better than, than what we've got now in terms of, and in the East region, you know, here's here's the bracket. Uh, you'd be seeing the coach, you know, you'd, you'd see his analytics guy whispering to him, you know, the clock would be counting down. It, it would just be great TV. You, you mentioned the analytics guy, or I'm thinking more video coordinators from that right. perspective. <laughs> I cannot imagine the amount of work that, that would go into uh, having a game plan for, for who you want to play against for a video coordinator. That sounds pretty miserable, but for almost everyone else involved, that, that sounds pretty cool. Well, and then this is the last part of my my grand proposal is that we would uh, we would kill uh, all basketball on Selection Sunday. You've got to finish your your tournaments um, by the the previous evening, and that gives the video coordinator a solid uh, twelve hours because you know when the when the last game's over, you know you know the field, you know your seed. So the video coordinator only has to look at you know four potential opponents so hopefully that that would make the person not have a heart attack (laughs) there we go so now i want to get into the net a little bit from here based off of the framework that you just built we can kind of talk about where it hits that where it doesn't hit that but one thing that again i think is understated is the net since it's replacing rpi which was being used as an organizational tool the net is trying to do something other than that. And I think that's the biggest problem is that all we really need out of, if we're, if we are going to use the quadrant system, which now we're assuming that's still in play, all we really need out of the net is to be able to rank the teams one through 353 in a predictive way. And then we'll use the quadrant system as a pseudo wins above bubble type of metric. And I'm not entirely sure what do you think is the NCAA on board with that or it's it feels like they're trying to do both things create a resume and a predictive rating into one yes it does feel like that and there's there's two veils of ignorance uh intervening in between your very good question and an answer that uh, anyone could offer one is as has the point has been made very well by others uh, we don't know what the net is. Uh, we, we still don't. Uh, it's It's been reverse engineered with, with some success, but we, we don't know it's nuts and bolts. And we have not seen uh, a run of what the net would have looked like on Selection Sunday from last March or any previous March, which would be a, a huge aid to understanding it. So that's that's one issue. But then a more thoroughgoing uh, and endemic 
uh, obstacle to answering your very good question is just inherent in the committee system itself. And that is that the NCAA, once they've made the decision to have a committee, they very appropriately uh, give that committee the power and the autonomy to uh, select and seed the field. And in practice, as all who have gone through the very excellent uh, mock selection exercise that the NCAA conducts annually, what that is built out of is simply mouse clicks by, or trackpad clicks or whatever technology you use uh, by the people in the room. And you're just continually, almost numbingly presented with teams on your laptop screen, you know, Virginia Tech or, you know, Mississippi State, which one's better? Well, this one's better. Okay, here's here's three teams. Rank them one, two, three. Okay, and you just do it over and over and over. It's built in that iterative fashion by all of the members, and you can uh, give those members whatever principles and presentations you want at the beginning, but they're going to do what they want. The cool thing about the mock selection exercise when I did it, and this has been six years ago now, so that call that, you know, I mean, the RPI was still well entrenched, but I, I was there to topple it, you know, in the in the belly of the beast. And they gave us actual team sheets. And I, I literally, you know, never looked at them because they were they all they had was, you know, the RPI and various um, versions of the RPI. I was like, I don't need this. You know, I, I, I'm doing Tuesday Drews. I, I know what's up, you know, so, and I just, uh, I just rocked on it that way. And real committee members are like that. They will do what they do. So whatever principles, you know, and whatever great ideas we have out here outside of the committee room, you know, those are the people who are going to build and seed the field and they're, they're going to do it with their trackpad clicks. And uh, that's, that's how this sausage is made. Got it. And yeah, that's ultimately a lot of the frustration is, is again, it goes back to the objective. There's not necessarily a defined enough ob objective. The conspiracy theorists would say <laughs> that it's a function of getting high majors in. Is there truth in that or no? I just worry about uh, the Vic Bubis effect and that if you're looking at record versus top 50 blank, uh, then that is inherently unjust to mid-majors. And I'm not sure, you know, after only one tournament, I'm not sure that that is successfully addressed by the quadrant system. Now, obviously, the quadrant uh, hierarchy represents an analytic step forward. It is a good thing to recognize that there are differences in opponents, whether you play them at home, on the road, or on a neutral floor. So full credit to the NCAA for that. But my concern is that, you know, quadrant one victories has simply become the new uh, top 50 victories. And if we do that, and if we count them in, you know, sheer counting terms, the way we used to rebounds, then we haven't made as much of an advance as we think, because obviously mid-majors, uh, you can be the best mid-major head coach scheduler in the world. You can be a regular Tim Miles at Colorado State in 2012, but you just don't get as many opportunities for those games as you do nestled in the comforting scheduling heart of a major conference. So I worry uh, I, I, that is the ultimate conspiracy is the, is the structure of the sport itself. And, you know, some years uh, it works out better for mid-majors than others. And some, you know, mid-majors uh, just aren't as strong as a group, but the structure itself tends to have that bias toward the major conferences. And I'm not sure after one tournament that the uh, quadrant uh, tiering system goes uh, far enough to address that concern. Interestingly enough, the first release of the net ratings there were mid-majors in spots that they probably shouldn't be based off of the predictive rankings that we have. The fact that this new tool likes Loyola, Marymount, and, and teams like that is a little bit counterintuitive to what people might think. Um, so again, I think that the more important part of the conversation is 
the purpose and and that net is just an organizational metric. But if we do get into the structure of it, uh, the thing that has confused me the most is the components. So there's five different components. You were actually the the first one to tweet this out, uh, the little graphic that they made. And the first one is team value index. Supposedly, these are in descending order of weight. So team value index is is number one. Number two is net efficiency. Number three is winning percentage. Number four is adjusted win percentage. And number five is scoring margin. And the thing that immediately stands out to me is the collinearity between those components. And I think this was the best thing that Nate Silver said in his little rant on on the net. Um, It... To me, it seems like the people that built the net might not have even known what some of these things mean. And it's this has been my biggest thing on Twitter is that they say that scoring margin is capped at 10, but they have net efficiency, which is literally scoring margin divided by possessions. So the net efficiency component isn't capped at 10. Have you had any... I, Personally, I have talked to a few people that are on the fringes of knowing <laughs> a, about the net and about Google, who was involved in, and I've gotten some inconsistent information, which is kind of in line with the net as a whole. Uh, but I am of the uh, opinion that they really might not have understood that net efficiency and scoring margin are basically the same thing. Uh, do you do you have any insight on that? I do not have any insight to report. That would be um, that would be troubling if that were true. Uh, the NCAA, uh, just to uh, recap, I mean, the, they started this process while the RPI was still in place by reaching out to uh, a number of of colleagues who absolutely do know the difference between scoring margin and, and net efficiency. Uh, so they were talking to the right people, and I'm not sure if the ball was subsequently uh, dropped after the so-called analytic summit or, or what came of that. But the you know what you call collinearity um, could be uh, walked down a couple steps, uh, <laughs> fanciness-wise, and maybe also referred to simply as, as double counting. Uh, but it, it's uh, it's. It's it's odd to see. I'll, I'll put it that way. And again, it it could be uh, something where um, I you know they it, it would be troubling that they have to work around something that's brand new. I'll, I'll put it that way. And maybe they do work around it. And again, the way to know that is to look at what these would have produced on Selection Sunday, uh, 2018. The the irony of any discussion of a rating system is that it's not like we're going to look, uh, I think, you know, based on comments this week, I think we will get a look at, you know, Selection Sunday 2018 net ratings. And uh, the internet and Twitter being what it is, when we do, uh, people will go nuts and, and say, this is the worst thing ever. This is this is travesty. Um, in my experience, rating systems really aren't like that. Uh, you know, I don't think that the net will say that Mississippi Valley State should get a one seed. That That's not the problem with rating systems that, that don't, uh, you know, have the, the right uh, groundings. Even the RPI was in the ballpark the majority of the time. The problem with the RPI uh, was twofold. It, it was prone to outliers and it could be gamed. Those are my concerns with the net. Not that it will say bad teams are good or good teams are bad, but A, that it can be gamed, and B, that it will have egregious outliers. Maybe that won't be the case, but we, we don't know that yet and that's a rather uh, surprising situation to be in because this system as you say will be used as the sorting mechanism for an upcoming ncaa tournament field so i'm a little surprised to be saying these words but uh, we don't know exactly how it'll work that's a good point about gaming even if the net can't be gamed the quadrant system like we talked about where your your best five wins and your worst five losses matter so much that can still be gamed. So 
I think it's a little bit inevitable. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening with the net in terms of what it prefers, what teams, what schedules, the whole margin of victory thing. We don't know yet. What was your reaction to the Twitter reaction of of the day one of the net? It was predictably uh, people making fun of Loyola Marymount and whatever the case is. But for the most part, do you think that it's a little bit too early for that? Yes, it is too early for that. And the interesting thing about uh, sports analytics as a field is that now it is a field big enough that clearly there were some people uh, that did not understand that this is what a, a no priors system, you know, looks like in November. This is what the RPI always looked like. It's it's just total chaos. Well, not total chaos, but it's it's more chaotic than what you'll get uh, very soon. So there there were some reactions like that. I also heard it or heard or saw and or saw it referred to as worse than the RPI. Uh, it is not worse than the RPI. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I, I won't. Uh, I won't kick the RPI when it's already gone. And, but it is not worse than the RPI. Um, that being said, uh, the only affirmative uh, praise that I've heard uh, for in favor of the net have have been non sequiturs. Uh, one, I already mentioned, it's better than the RPI, which I agree with. And then two, it's only November. Well, yeah, it is only November. We can still look at the uh, actual rankings now. And uh, they so far are pretty well correlated, as you tweeted out. They're pretty well correlated with uh, scoring margin uh, without regard for uh, the quality of the opponent. Now, maybe that will correct over the course of the season, but that is definitely something to keep one's eye on. And that is one question that we have about a new metric that we haven't seen uh, put through its paces before. So th those are the kinds of things that I'll be watching as the, as the season goes on. Yep. And David Hess on Twitter made a pretty good point about the pushback to people overreacting and digging so into it is since there's only been six games right now, you actually can you can get a little bit inside what the algorithm is doing uh, by looking at just those six games because they play such a big role in the rating right now. But later in the season, when there's 30 games, it, it, it will be harder for those outliers to to stick out. So it's it's a good way to reverse engineer, I guess, right now. Just for posterity's sake, I guess. I did go on College Basketball Reference, and they have a they use their simple rating system to basically have an adjusted efficiency margin with no priors, and it does look surprisingly good. So I remember before Kempom started adjusting for preseason priors, I do remember it looking really wacky in November. But right now, the top five on College Basketball Reference is Duke number one, Auburn number two, Gonzaga number three. Texas Tech number four and Nebraska number five. The one that would would cause pushback in the top twenty five, or I guess major pushback, is San Francisco at seventeen. But we at least know why. It's it's because they their margin of victory is the is the second most in the NCAA behind NC State. So we can at least tell why i think one of the frustrating things with net and loyola marymount in particular is there's no obvious reason why they haven't beaten teams by a ton they have one road win i think it, it, off the top of my head i'm pretty sure it's just one road win that there's a theory going around that road wins mean a lot more in net so yeah i've brought them up a ton on this podcast but i guess they're they're the guinea pig right now yeah, and that was an excellent uh, distillation of day one and day two net discussion, which I found uh, somewhat unsatisfying because you had one group saying these are the worst things ever because Ohio State's number one and Loyola Marymount and, and Radford, LOL. But then the response to that was it's November and let's walk away and not worry about it. Um, the David has uh, Jordan Sperber uh, reaction seems to me to be the proper one. And it's a third reaction. It's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, this is early stuff, but we can still, you know, look at what's here. 
And, you know, uh, I write about college basketball. That's, that's what I do anyway. I mean, Duke has only played seven games, but I still have to try and figure out how good they're really going to be. You know, Zion Williamson is making 72% of his dues. How, how likely is that to last? Yeah, it's only November, but I've still got to try and, you know, figure things out. So I, I went ahead and, and did look at the net rankings and, and had some concerns and, uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, to what extent those are addressed uh, by the net's uh, inner workings and to what extent they're addressed by, by the simple passage of time. But I think we can at least you know, look at what's there and, and discuss it, even though it is November. If you were in charge, when would you have released these rankings? And you're not allowed to say you would have released them with last year's rankings, because that's probably the right answer and, and what, you, what, what you would have said. But would you have waited a little bit longer? Yeah, that would have been the cool thing would be, you know, uh, to uh, to uh, show them off uh, last year and uh, say, and here's 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 a little taste of what, you know, goodbye RPI. And here, here's what you're going to get next year with our cool new metric. But um, it, the timing to me is uh, less crucial than simply um somebody there or, or a group of somebodies uh, there to answer the questions that on this podcast, Jordan Sperber has very uh, properly brought up. Um, here's why we chose to use these five components and here's where you see them at work. And yes, we've got this and we definitely know what we're doing. Uh, you know, they could have done that uh, as far as I'm concerned. They could have done it on the first day of the season and said, you know, look, this is going to be a no prior system and it's going to be completely wacky. You know, watch along with us as, you know, Buffalo after the first day or whomever becomes the number one team in the country. And I think people would have understood, you know, that that's fine. Uh, so timing is one thing, but uh, a clear statement of, of what's going on. Um, that would have been equally welcome. And in a way, we're still kind of uh, waiting for that, I think. David Warlock, who works for the NCAA on Twitter, he said that the reason why it came out when it did is that's when the RPI always came out. So they felt like that was being transparent. The difference, and I, and I made this distinction on Twitter, is that the RPI was a known formula and it was being published on other sites regardless. But yeah, I think it's it's a hard argument for him to make that it was a transparency thing when we don't have the 2018 ratings and we don't have the inner workings of the formula like we did with RPI. Uh, I did actually ask him to come on the podcast and he declined. But going forward, I think at the very least they are considering more information on this stuff. And hopefully that's something that we get, I guess. Well, first of all, I want you to know that I'm I'm going to keep going on this podcast bravely, even though I just learned I was just your second choice. But I'm I'm glad to be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just to defend myself, I already had you locked in as a guest. I already had you locked in. First, you, David Warlock. You know, you're you're always uh, headlining over me. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 I want to piggyback on a, a point um, that that is implicit in what you just said, and, and this is what I mean. You know, to bring this a little bit for full circle, uh, I actually, coincidentally, I attended the same mock selection as Nate Silver. And for anybody who hasn't been with uh, NCAA uh, staffers. These are really good people. They're very bright and they care passionately about college basketball. And that, you know, of course, when you spend whatever the mock selection is, I mean, it's like on one night, and two days, effectively. But by lunch of the second day, when that had become apparent, you know, and that they were still going to use the RPI. <laughs> uh, Nate, who, by the way, was a former boss of mine, he came up to me at lunch on the second day, and he's like, why does the NCAA keep using the RPI? And the subtext of his question was, you know, you can think from afar, well, they must just not understand. <laughs> you know, they're just not smart enough. To, that's not the case at all. These are really, really good people who uh, – are good at their jobs and they're, and they're, uh, they're, they know their basketball inside and out. And there is some uh, organizational 
uh, resistance, and I don't mean active resistance, I just mean friction <laughs> that uh, makes it difficult for them to simply do something. And I'm not talking about, I mean, winds, winds above bubble, maybe that's a, a bit out there, but simply saying, hey, let's take a composite of known uh, predictive and resume metrics and let's you know, balance them as best we can. That would have been a pretty vanilla, straightforward way to uh, replace the RPI, I would think, and not a lot of people would have had a problem with that, but th there's uh, there's some tension there to getting between point A and point B. And frankly, I, uh, I have a lot of respect for and salute the people who are trying to, uh, to navigate that journey because it has proven to be a difficult one at times. One of my last questions for you is if a head coach inquired for for your consultation and scheduling or just any general selection process strategy obviously we don't know for sure but what would be your advice to that coach get those quadrant one opportunities and you know <laughs> uh, enroll in those uh MTEs uh, as soon as you can. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you can talk Kansas into coming and playing a home game on your floor, then great. But assuming that that's not going to happen, then, you know, carve out space to uh, play those road games. Try to, you know, use the uh, best uh, forecasting um, tools out there for your for your opponent uh, team strength the following season and obviously try to uh, get somebody on the low side of, of quadrant one and play a, a road game or three against those opponents uh, somebody you think is going to be overrated but you've got to get those quadrant one opportunities again I, I don't think that's entirely right or fair. Uh, there's three other quadrants by definition, but uh, it's just funny how these discussions. Uh, if if you put if you put that out there, uh, these discussions resolve themselves into you know one quick thing: top 50 wins, uh, quad one wins, and so uh, dance to that tune and go out and get them. Yeah, that uh, makes sense to me for sure. It's something that I have talked to about with coaches. And then again, like I said earlier, that margin of victory component is the other thing that I think coaches are at least thinking about right now. Who knows if they're acting on it or not, but at least thinking about it. So I appreciate your time. This has been extremely enlightening. I, I hope. What uh, is there anything else that you have to add any final points on the net, the selection process, the RPI, anything? Um, just that if it does turn out that the net is overly influenced by straight scoring margin, I will be um, appalled in terms of selection and seeding justice, but I will be analytically fascinated because one of the things that's always uh, intrigued me about the very concept of running up the score is the tension between that idea and the thought that we have that you should be playing defense all the time. And defense is half the game. And so when you say running up the score, what you're really saying is you're still trying on defense. <laughs> <laughs> that's supposed to be something that we do anyway. So uh, I would love to see these ideals clash in action. And uh, it's understood that if you're doing things like, you know, shooting quick threes while you're you know 30 ahead, yeah, that's one thing. But uh, I, I remember vividly once seeing Sean Miller take an angry timeout, you know, late in the second half of an Arizona game where they were up like, like 25 because some guy had missed a rotation. Um, and that was applauded by the announcers, but you could objectively call that running up the score. <laughs> so where do we, where do we fall on this question? Um, maybe we'll get to find out. So thank you, Ned. Yeah. And it's also an interesting analytic experiment from the purpose of if, if net does end up going that way, we can look at the influence it's having, you know, the, at, when the 10 margin of victory cap came out that was everyone's first instinct is that oh well uh, there's going to be an, a large number of games now where teams win by 11 or 12 because of the incentive structure i don't think that is going to happen this year just from my uh basic conversations that i don't think it's a big focus right now on, on that 10 but it does have certain forces i guess in, in the game 
Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. Can't wait. Well, thank you so much again. And hopefully I can have you on soon and we can actually talk some basketball, not just some rating systems about basketball. Yeah, let's let's talk about teams next time. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jordan. Go hand checking Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony Kuko. Uh, uh, uh,